Hello and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Polio Experts. Today we're here with Darcy Levison uh, from the polio eradication team here at WHO. Uh, and Darcy, uh, you just came back from a trip to Chad where there were some polio campaigns and that's what we wanted to talk to you about. But first maybe uh, in terms of context, why are, they, why are they conducting immunization campaigns at the moment in Chad? Uh, so Chad isn't a polio endemic country, um, but there were cases in Nigeria in 2016 of wild polio virus, and there's um, kind of the, the threat of polio virus moving through the Lake Chad um, islands and then uh, reaching populations in Chad and in other countries that um, have territories within the island uh, network. I mean, that, that's something that everybody's at the moment talking about uh, uh, in this outbreak response, the, the, the islands on Lake Chad. Uh, can you give us some context how to picture it? How big is this lake? How many countries border it? How many islands are there? Do people live on these islands? Um, so it's a very interesting geographical area. The lake is, is enormous, so there's five different countries that have territories within it. That's uh, the Central African Republic, Chad, Cameroon, uh, Niger and Nigeria. Um, and the lake itself is not a lake as we might think of it, um, perhaps in Europe. It's not so deep, it's just quite like a shallow, broad lake that covers this huge territory. And so within it there's all of these islands, and it's more like an archipelago, I guess. So the islands are very close together and often there are uh, masses of um, kind of loose vegetation that floats across the surface of, of the shallow water. Um, and blocks off different areas and creates new islands. And so it's actually a very difficult geographical place to, in which to eradicate polio because you have this um, area which is very hard to map where there's um, vegetation moving, where the water levels are going up and down um, with, with kind of um, both the seasons and also the lake is receding. It's been receding for um, several decades now. So it's really this complex changing environment where a virus could very easily spread um, not only across the water in, in boats but also because people can go between islands through walking often um, through the very shallow water. Because it's quite shallow. Okay. Yeah. So you first went to N'Djamena, the capital of course, but then uh, you, you actually went out to the islands. Tell us about your experiences and some of the challenges in, in reaching some, some of those areas? Yeah, so it's just an incredibly difficult place in which to deliver vaccines. Um, so even to get from Enjimina, it, you either, either um, have to go on, on very rough roads for um, sort of five or six hours in, in a four by four, or you need to get a, a, a tiny plane uh, from the central airport landing on sand outside of Bol, which is the main uh, town um, in, the, in the Chadian section of the islands. And then from there, um, with vaccines, you have to go down uh, to the lake shore and you need to get in the tiny boat and then you need to motor often. Um, well, the island I went to, it took us 15 and a half hours motoring in this tiny... 15 hours of motoring in a... In a tiny, um, like, open-top little motorboat. Um, a very sort of basic design, but a, a plastic hull, which means that it's a little bit uh, more secure and, and more stable to, to carry people in. And, it, and it's hot and, and, and yeah. dusty and... Yeah, extremely hot, so above 40 degrees uh, nearly every day that I was there, um, uh, reaching, you know, 45, 46, um, really just like burning, burning sun. Uh, it's a very dry environment in many places. Um, you have to carry all of your own water because uh, the lake water is not clean to drink. Um, and it's just a very relentless task. So you're sitting in a, in a boat for hours where there's very little mobile phone signal. Um, often, because the lake is so shallow, um, the motor on the boat doesn't always engage with the water because it's, there's not enough water there for it to engage. So um, the person who was navigating us had to get out of the boat at one point and push us for over two kilometers, um, which was just a really 
um, relentless task in the burning sun. Um, it took two and a half hours to, to just get across an area that was about two kilometers wide doing that. Um, and then once you actually get to the islands, that's not the end of the journey. So you then have to get out of the motorboat with the vaccine box, uh, boxes and all of your supplies and um, the island where I went to, which is an island called Banagori. Um, it's so remote that no UN agency reaches there and no WHO program reaches there apart from the polio program. So there's very little infrastructure. Um, and when you get there, you have to walk uh, for a kilometre or so um, across dry grazing land. And then through, we had to walk through another se section of um, the lake where it was kind of intersecting with the island and then cross another kilometre of um, this, this sort of rough, rough ground and then into a little wooden uh, boat. Um, it's kind of like a punt, I guess. Um, we had to load all our stuff on that, but very carefully so as not to damage so the thin... you carry all your, the, the, the vaccine, the vaccine carriers, all your food, all your water, everything across... The all yeah, all all, all, all the supplies. Degree. Yeah, all the supplies that we would need for the for the campaign. Um, and then we had to paddle for 35 minutes through uh, reeds in a, a little creek. And then once we got to the edge of, end of that, that wasn't the end of the journey either. So uh, at, at the point where we landed, that was still three hours walk from the village where we were going to be staying for the night. That's the village where the health center is. Um, we were lucky because uh, on the island there's no transport of any kind. There's only two motorbikes, both of which are paid for by um, WHO. And um, those, those bikes are often broken, but when we were there they were working, so we were able to use those two motorbikes to make the journey shorter. Um, but really for the people uh, who live there, it's just a very uh, inhospitable environment. And um, actually one thing that the program does um, on Banagore is um, provide um, health services for other immunization programs. So um, the consultant I was with was also looking at measles surveillance. Um, we visited the health center and we saw um, some of the other uh, immunization activities that um, facilitated that. And um, it's, it's really the people who live there can't get to the health center. It takes such a long time, so it's really um, just a very, a very uh, interesting, complex environment. How, how many people? I mean, this particular island. How large is it? How many people live on it? Uh, so it's an island of several thousand people, um, but it's a very uh, diverse set of communities. So uh, on the island there are uh, nomadic groups. Um, so I visited um, a vaccination activity happening um, in, in two nomadic villages where. Um, a, 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 a people called the Ferric live. Um, it's also um, a place where there's a market, so there's traders coming in and out of the island. Um, there are people who live in the villages, and there's actually people who live even more remote than, than Banagori itself. So um, Dr. Adele, who's the woman who I was accompanying, she uh, often has gone for another six hours in one of the little wooden boats um, up creeks to reach uh, children who live even more remote than, than Banagore itself. Because of course that's what you have to do. This virus will make it there, so we have to make it there, or, or, or yeah, or have to make it there first. Uh, yeah, if we're going to reach every last child, we do have to go to these lengths. Yeah. Um, but it's really incredible to see how far those lengths are and what's required. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Is, uh, is insecurity, I mean, you hear Boko Haram, is, is it an issue? Or? Um, so it has certainly been an issue in the past. Um, and uh, there's still big sections of the lake as a whole which are uh, still inaccessible because of insurgency and, and insecurity. Um, in uh, the Chadian section of the islands, um, there were insurgent groups in Boko Haram there in um, sort of 2015, early 2016. Um, those uh, groups have now retreated up uh, away from those islands, um, which is really good for uh, the, the polio program because it means we can actually get to these places and vaccinate these children. Yeah. But one of the big threats is that a lot of these children, um, there's this big gap where they weren't immunized because of insurgent groups. Right. So a big job of the task team is trying to go out and reach those children who have never received any vaccine doses. And where we went, there were a lot of children who were zero dose, um, so who will be being vaccinated for the first time. That's fantastic that they were they were they were reached for the for, for the first time. But in terms of the logistics, you know, you, you mentioned the heat; it's 40 degrees. 
the vaccine has to be cool. Is, mm. is it, so how, how do you keep it cool? In, in, in uh, so, so that's one of the big difficulties. Um, and uh, one, one thing to do is just be very diligent. So we kept carried our vaccines in a cool box and we never opened the cool box unless we really, really had to, to, to vaccinate a child. So it was just open it and not open it all the way, just open the lid a little tiny bit, reach in, get a vaccine vial, vaccinate the child and, and keep the box um, as cool as possible. Um, the program is um, lucky in that um, it has recently been able to put uh, vaccine um, like larger uh, refrigerators on some of the islands, which means that islands can keep a stock of the vaccine. Um, is there electricity there to run? Uh, on, on, some of, on some of the islands, there's, there's generators. Okay. Um, but electricity is very limited. So, for instance, on Banagori, there is there are um, there's a little electricity. There's a few generators, but for instance, we weren't able to charge our laptops um, and we had to send our phones uh, with uh, someone who works on the island to, to his home where he had uh, access to a generator so they could be charged there. So really one of the challenges is not only stuff like keeping the vaccines cool and carrying a water, but it's also things like keeping in contact with um, people in, uh, in Bol and other people in the task team, like making sure that you're always saving the charge on your phone, that you're always um, ensuring that your supplies last, you know? Um, and so that was like a very interesting aspect, which I think um, maybe people don't think about so much. It's how do you sort of manage and keep in contact with everyone who's working in the, in the campaign. Um, and, and when you finally did reach uh, these communities, uh, uh, was there reaction? Were they accepting of the vaccination? Uh, was there a lot of engagement? Uh, um, yeah, there was a lot of engagement and, um, and widespread acceptance of the vaccine. Um, and I think that's largely down to the work of people in the communities. So um, UNICEF trains community mobilizers who go out to uh, people's homes before the campaign or even a day before, a few hours before and say you know the vaccine vaccinations are coming and this is why it's important and they really explain to parents um, and that's very very important for vaccine acceptance um, but I think it's also that the vaccinators themselves are from those communities so when I went to uh, see the vaccination activities um, at the ferric um, the ferric settlements um, the the woman vaccinating was a nomadic person herself from that community so she was vaccinating you know her neighbors children other people in her community people knew her and so that really built up trust it, it sounds amazing and, and, and so logistically difficult I mean you, you mentioned the islands actually move I imagine that means that the populations move I imagine during the rainy season everything changes again and and uh, to, to, to all this must really further complicate uh, reaching reaching the population. Yeah, and it's and it's complex because people are moving down the the island network from country to country. Yeah. So, um, in outside Bol, uh, there's um, a number of, of refugee camps. One of which is called Dar es Salaam, which is the biggest refugee camp in the area. And many people there are Nigerian, and they're people who have, have been displaced by by insurgency, and but also by things like global warming, by the lake receding, by sort of changing their fortune, and, and have wound up in Chad and potentially carrying the virus with them. Darcy, it's been fascinating. I think you know we're here in Geneva, and, and uh, uh, very often I think we don't understand what the real challenges are. You know, our working conditions are. We sometimes email our colleagues in Chad, and if they don't respond straight away, we wonder, you know, what, what's going on? Why are they not responding? But I think you've really illustrated what the real challenges are. Working, trying to reach every last child. Uh, finding them first, reaching them when there is no real easy way to, to, to reach them. Incredibly difficult conditions. Uh, yeah. Conditions. I think uh, our teams there really must be supported in any way that uh, that we can. Uh, do you have any Do you have any final thoughts for our for our audience today? I think just that it's. It's very important to see what we do in this wider context and understand that, as you say, uh, some places are just really, really difficult environments to work in. And that's why it's so important to support um, the program and also um, support the program in these difficult settings. Um, polio eradication won't happen until we reach every child with the vaccine. Um, and so it's very important to kind of sustain support and um, 
and, and continue continue supporting these amazing people doing these amazing things in these just incredibly difficult environments. Thank you, firstly, for sharing uh, your insights, but thank you that you went to such great lengths to, 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 reach, to reach that last child. And, uh, of course, a huge thank you to our, to our country colleagues and, and, and partners. Uh, for me, it's been fascinating and, and it's given a lot of insight into what the realities are that, that our colleagues are, are working on. So, thank you and thank you for watching and join us again on another episode of uh, uh, Coffee with, uh, with Polio Experts. Thank you. Thank you.